In this video, we are going to talk about inner products. This concept is closely related to the dot product that we encounter in Euclidean vectors, because inner products are an extension of this concept. So people first define dot products for Euclidean vectors because they were useful. And then later on, mathematicians found that we can actually generalize this concept for other mathematical objects. So you can understand dot products as a subset of the larger concept of inner products. So what exactly is an inner product? So uh, the best way to understand inner product is to understand it as a process. So it is a process by which we assign a value to two vectors. So let's say I have a vector alpha and a, I have a vector beta. So the inner product will work its magic and then it will assign a value to these two vectors and then we will use this notation to represent an inner product. So we can define this process of have, uh, of starting off with two vectors and then assigning a value with it however we want. So this whole process is called an inner product and we can define this process however we want as long as three rules are satisfied. So the first rule is that your inner product must be defined in such a way where the inner product between alpha and beta is equal to the inner product between beta and alpha conjugate. So I'm going to use a star to represent a conjugate. The second rule is that the inner product of a vector with itself must always be larger than or equal to zero. And equality will hold, that means the inner product will be equal to zero if and only if alpha is equal to the null vector. And the third rule is that if I have a vector alpha and I'm taking the inner product uh, of alpha with another vector that is represented as a linear combination of two other vectors, beta and gamma, then our inner product must be defined in such a way where this expression is going to be equal to b times the inner product of alpha and beta plus c times the inner product of alpha and gamma. So these are the three rules that you need to satisfy. If you can define a process by which you can assign a value for any two given vectors and then this process satisfies these three rules, then you would have a proper inner product. So associated with the concept of an inner product are several keywords. So the first thing is the concept of a norm. So the norm is actually defined as the square root of a vector with itself, of the inner product of a vector with itself. So let's say I have a vector called alpha, and then the norm of this vector will be represented by this notation, which would be equal to the square root of the, of the inner product of the vector with itself. So this is actually a generalization of the concept of length. So you can think about Euclidean vectors again. So let's say I have a Euclidean vector that is equal to a i plus b j, so that i and j unit vectors. So we have this vector here called v. And then if I <clears throat> wanted to find the length of this vector, I'd just say the length is equal, I'll just use a Pythagorean theorem, which is equal to the square root of a squared plus b squared. And a squared plus b squared is actually equal to the dot product of v with itself. And you remember dot product is actually just a, a particular instance of the larger concept of an inner product. So this is also an inner product. So you can see that taking the square root of an inner product would actually give us a length in the case of Euclidean vectors. So you can see, uh, so obviously the concept of length doesn't really quite work if we have things like functions for our vectors or if we move on to higher dimensions like five or six dimensions. But it doesn't really stop us from continuing to perform this process. So that's why I say that the concept of a norm is actually the generalization of the concept of a length. So if the norm of a vector is equal to 1, then I'd say that this is a normalized vector. So this is just some terminology that you need to know. So the second keyword that you need to know is orthogonal. So if the inner product between two vectors, let's say I have a vector called alpha and a vector called beta, if the inner product between these two vectors is equal to zero, then I'd say that these two vectors are orthogonal. And if we have a set of vectors, let's say I have a set of vectors e1, e2, and all the way to en, so I have a set of n vectors, and then the inner products between them is defined in such a way where the inner product between ei and ej is equal to 1 if i is equal to j and it's equal to 0 if i is not equal to j then I'd say that this is that this set is a ortho normal set 
So this is an, another important keyword that you need to know. So the ortho obviously comes from the fact that the inner product is equal to 0 if i is not equal to j, and the normal comes from the fact that the inner product is equal to 1 if i is equal to j. And then we can actually more concisely express this behavior with the Kronecker delta function. So this delta function literally means if i is equal to j, then it's equal to 1. If i is not equal to j, then it's equal to 0. So that's all that is. So uh, the concept of an ortho orthonormal set is important because if we have, let's say, a vector space V, and then for this vector space I have a basis. So this basis is formed by a set of n vectors. So I have this basis. So it is always advantageous for this basis to also be an orthonormal set. So a basis does not always have to be orthonormal. So any set of vectors that are linearly independent so just remind you of the requirements of being a vector space if they are linearly independent and then they span the vector space v which means any other vector within v can be expressed as a linear combination of these vectors as long as these two conditions are satisfied then you will already have a basis it does not have to be orthonormal but if you do have a basis and you do manage to make this basis orthonormal this could actually make our lives a lot easier because Choosing a basis that is orthonormal can help us calculate inner products much easier. So let's say I have a vector called alpha, and then let's say this basis is orthonormal. So I can, so this is a basis and this is an orthonormal, and I can express alpha as a linear combination of all these vectors. So all the way to a n e m, and let's say I have another vector called beta. It's equal to b one e one b2, e2, and so you get the idea, all the way to bn. And let's say this is also an orthonormal set. So if I'm trying to take the inner product between alpha and beta, turns out this will actually be equal to the conjugate of a1 times b1 plus the conjugate of a2 times b2 all the way to the conjugate of an times bn. And you can actually easily prove this using the fact that these uh, these vectors are orthonormal. So I'm not going to show you the proof. You can actually easily prove this using this uh, with the help of this third uh, third axiom over here. Using this, you can easily prove that this is this will indeed be true. So that is why it is always advantageous to choose a vector that is, uh, a, choose a basis that is also orthonormal because any other vector you can always express it as a linear combination of the vectors within the spaces and then once you've found this linear combination if you want to take a inner product of this vector with another vector you don't have to go through any uh, complicated co uh, calculations all you have to do is just to take all the coefficients and then perform this series and then you will have your inner product